How are you this morning? Very good. You know something I really like that I've just heard? Of course, this is my first time here, but just sitting and listening, this is a church that talks back. I like that. I like the diversity, I like the enthusiasm, I like the energy, and I hope that by the time we're done this morning, you'll still have some. <laughs> Good, so you like to laugh too, that, that makes me more comfortable. Um, I don't know how much anyone knows here, I, I know very few people here. So I don't know if Pastor Paul or Pastor Carlson, what do you guys call him? Pastor Paul, I don't know if anyone has done any introduction or any background. I do recognize um, some very old friends. They are not very old, but our friendship goes back a very long ways. Let me be careful how I say that. Crystal, you guys, I was at their wedding. Like, dear Lord, how many... 16 years ago, so it's been a hot minute. And I haven't seen you in a long time, but we do keep up. My husband is here with me today. You can all make him very awkward and embarrassed and turn around and wave at him in the back. And he does not like the limelight, so I'm going to shine it right on him for just a second. Um, all right, so a little bit about me just by way of introduction before we get started. Is that a good place to start sure. so that we feel like we've got a little common ground going? Uh, my name is Sarah McDougall and I am an abuse recovery coach, an author, and a trainer for organizations on how to respond to abuse in the faith community. So I do um, a lot of live videos, I have a YouTube channel, I work with the End It Now Task Force for Sexual Policy on Ethics and Misconduct for the North American Division and I've been with them serving on that task force since 2018. Um, I've published seven books and ebooks on abuse, on abuse recovery, on the myths we believe, the predators we trust, and how to make our churches safer places for the vulnerable, which is, I believe, what Jesus Christ calls us to do. Would you agree with me? Amen. All right. So um, I'm a mother and a wife. We have four kids together, and um, we have some neurodivergent kids in that mix. So we deal with uh, autism, ADHD, you name it. I'm also a homeschooling mom, so I stay busy. What can I say? Um, when Pastor Paul was talking about this, he said that I, I recently preached over at McDonald Road, and uh, he said, I, we want you to do that, that sermon here because our church needs it too. Um, the really fun part is when they say, hey, come talk about uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, predators in the church, and make it family friendly, please. <laughs> So um, that's always enjoyable as a fine line to walk. Here's the thing. I believe that these topics are absolutely family topics. Do you know why? Because our adults and our children in the church are either growing up or have grown up, many of us, experiencing some form of abuse, predatory behavior, or domestic violence. And if we're not talking about it in church, then what point is there? So I promise to be at least as family friendly as all the stories of the Old Testament so nobody needs to get up and walk out on me, all right? <laughs> all right, before we start, I want to kind of bring it down to a very elemental level. But first, I'd like to ask for the Holy Spirit. Will you guys bow your heads with me just for a quick prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, I know we've already prayed more than once this morning. And I know I've prayed a few times more than that, just preparing for this presentation. I pray that you would be with us as we study your word, that you would fill me and everyone here and those who are listening online with your Holy Spirit. And that even though today's topic is not a simple or easy one, that you would have us hear your message your voice, through your word, in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
All right, so when I was an English major, they often talked about writing for your audience. And even the news, reporters, journalists, learn that it's best to be able to write no higher than a sixth grade level, right? I don't know, is any, any other writers here? If you write too high, then you really limit your audience. So when you are teaching, and of course, as a homeschool mother and as someone who's worked with children in the past, I've learned the best way to express concepts that are highly important is to distill them down to their very essence so that my child could understand. Now, that is not to treat everyone like children in any insulting way. It's just that if it's too complex, it's hard for us to break it down and take it home with us. So I want to start with a little parable that even the smallest person here could understand. Once upon a time, oh, and I should say the credit to the concept for this goes to someone who follows my page on Facebook and she wrote the skeleton of it. So Anne, this is for you if you're watching. Once upon a time, there was a little person. The little person felt like they were special and had to get their own way and what other people needed or wanted didn't matter. And while other little people were learning to put others' needs first, this little person didn't. Then this little person grew up and became a very big little person. They tried to get their own way with other grown-ups, but it didn't work as well as they would like. Instead of focusing on being kind and helpful to others, this big little person made a habit of doing dishonest things and hurting people to get their way. Even though being dishonest and hurting people is wrong, the people in charge thought that the big little person was great because he was always nice to them in order to keep his power. The big little person appeared to live happily ever after while all the people close to them suffered. But in the, in the end, the big little person who liked to be cruel ended up suffering too because they never knew the joy of true love and healing. It was only when the people in charge decided to stop giving power to the big little person that the people around them were able to see what love and safety felt like and begin to heal. Amen. Now, the issues of abuse and domestic violence are heavily gendered issues. By that, I mean that more than 70% of the victims of domestic violence are female. And a whopping majority of the victims of sexual violence are female. Because I work exclusively with female victims, my working terminology is to use she for victims and he for abusers because, or perpetrators, because that's my area of work. Now, I like to start every presentation in a new place by stating that I also realize that by virtue of saying that 70 plus percent of domestic violence victims are female means the others are male. So men can be victims of domestic violence as well, although it tends to look very different than when female are, females are victims of domestic violence. And men can be victims of sexual violence as well. But when I am speaking so that I don't have to have a very long string of pronouns for you to parse out every time I'm referring to victim or perpetrator, I just use she for victim and he for perpetrator just to make it simple. But I want you to know before we get started that I'm not under any illusions that all perpetrators are male, that all victims are female, and that it can't sometimes also go the other direction. So just want to get that out of the way. It's very important when we're talking about highly charged, potentially controversial, emotionally volatile subjects where people have a lot of trauma involved and sometimes incredibly intense opinions, actually, no, pretty much always incredibly intense opinions, it's very important for us to start out on the same page so that we're using the same vocabulary, right? That way, when I'm saying one thing, you're not thinking something completely different, and we're communicating in an understandable way. Now, I'm not just going to be giving a thematic presentation this morning. I want you to have your Bibles out because we are going to go through a dozen texts 
to see what God has to say about this subject. But first, I'd like to start with a video. It's a five-minute video, and it lays out the foundation of some facts and research so that we have a statistical starting point. Did you know domestic violence is the second leading cause of death among African-American women. And domestic violence is the third leading cause of death among native and indigenous women. And domestic violence is the seventh leading cause of death among Caucasian women. Research tells us one in three women are sexually abused. One in six men are sexually abused. 82% of victims under 18 are female. 88% of child sexual abusers are male. Only six of every 1,000 rapists spends even one day in jail. 93% of child sexual abusers are known and trusted by the child. 34% of child sexual abuse victims are under age 12, often starting as young as age four. And sexual abusers have typically 50 to 150 victims before their first arrest and many more after. Now, most people realize if someone says, I love you and then hits you, something isn't okay. But domestic violence is much much more than just bruises. Non-physical domestic violence is typically far more damaging than we realize, and often we don't even recognize it. More than 70% of domestic violence victims are female. Domestic violence includes 13 types of abuse. These forms include child abuse, cultural abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, intellectual abuse, pets and property abuse, physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, social abuse, spiritual abuse, and verbal abuse. All 12 of these types center around one core mindset, a 13th form of abuse the abuse of power. Domestic violence happens in churches too. What happens when a church is not a safe place for victims? Clergy often say things like, you just need to forgive. If you gave him more sex, he wouldn't look at porn or cheat. Why are you digging up the past? You're so bitter. You need to stop talking about this. Go home and pray more instead of talking to others about your issues. You should be proud to suffer like Jesus did. I've never seen him be mean to anyone. Maybe you're making it up. If you leave, you'll ruin your children's lives and anger God. When churches and clergy refuse to listen to survivors and offer tangible, safety-focused support, when they remain uneducated about the patterns of abusive behaviors, when they avoid getting involved in messy situations, when they excuse sinful behaviors based on someone's good public image, when they give advice that fails to prioritize safety for the victims, when they fail to report all allegations to civil authorities for investigation, when they prioritize public reputation of the organization over truth and justice, and when churches and clergy hold victims accountable, but not the abusers who are causing harm, the church becomes complicit in double abuse. Double abuse misrepresents the heart of God and is a form of spiritual abuse. James 1 7 says pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress. This includes those who have been emotionally abandoned and abused by those who vowed before God to love, cherish, honor, and protect. Every church leader should learn the signs of abuse. If you are experiencing any of these, 
there is help. If you are afraid for your safety, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. Are you wondering if you are in an abusive relationship? Find resources at facebook.com slash Sarah McDougall author. Are you wanting resources for healing after trauma, coaching, courses, and other information? Get all of that and so much more at www.wildernesstowild.com. Domestic violence experts call all 13 of those forms of abuse domestic violence, not just the type that leaves bruises or a black eye or a split lip. When these happen outside of the home, they are still abuse and it still takes a toll on those experiencing it. Non-physical abuse, we often say, oh, well, you know, that's just psychological abuse, that's just emotional abuse, that's just spiritual abuse, whatever. You know, I'd, at least it's not bruises. I've heard so many women say, I wish he would have just hit me so I would have had a reason to leave. Because the way that we have approached the topic is that the only time that you have the chance to reasonably seek safety is if you have been physically assaulted. But the thing is that non-physical abuse causes significant distress and lasting damage, so much so that those who have survived both often say the bruise is healed, but the emotional and psychological trauma has taken years or decades to overcome. The effects of abuse, non-physical abuse, have been documented by scientists such as Bremner or Horowitz to manifest as post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, gastrointestinal issue issues, lower life satisfaction, autoimmune diseases, cancers, you name it. It can cause tremendous physical harm. Non-physical abuse is physical abuse of the brain and organ tissues. Abuse can be found in churches, church families, organizations, workplaces, friendship and social circles, cultural subgroups. The, these 13 forms of harm, they tend to appear in behavior patterns. And once you know what to look for, there are very predictable behavior patterns. Now, some people say, hey, well, we can all be mean sometimes, right? We all have times when we get frustrated with our spouse, when we get irritated or we lose our temper with our kids or we are not as patient as we would like to be and we fail. Does that mean I'm an abuser? Does that mean you're an abuser? Or does that mean you're a flawed human being? That's a whole different sermon in itself. But the very short answer is that being a flawed human being doesn't make you an abusive person. However, one instance, so that means, you know, an instance of getting really frustrated, of doing something you really shouldn't have done, that is followed by remorse, sorrow, repentance, and is not a continued pattern and habit that you continue perpetrating, even though you know it causes harm, that does not make you an abuser. Every one of us has the capacity to act abusively. But being an abusive person means that you're really not sorry unless you're caught. And you continue to show patterns of control and behavior over and over again. Oh, but wait, this is the church, right? We don't have abuse in the church. In the church is where we relax. We let down our hair. We let our kids run free. We know that here, these are people we trust. And so we don't have to be as cautious as we would be everywhere else out there, right? No. Statistics say that one in three women and one in six men will suffer sexual violence in their lifetimes. There is absolutely no evidence that the statistics are lower inside the church. In fact, the implication of some data is that statistics are higher in closed communities where people consider it important to protect the reputation of the organization or the group. That means in this room, one, statistically speaking, one out of every three women has been or currently is experiencing a form of domestic violence or sexual abuse. 
and one in six men in this room is carrying a secret you never want to have to be forced to tell anyone. So yes, isn't the world out there full of evil? It is. But all too often, evil masquerades as righteousness within our midst. And church is this place where we believe in trust and forgiveness and 77th chances. And it's a place where vulnerable sheep are easily exploited by wolves in sheep's clothing. Because churches very easily, unknowingly promote ways of thinking that increase abusive patterns of behavior in those who lust for power. So here's a question for you. Is power good? Yes? If you think his power is good, raise your hand. Well, that's a very low ratio of those. It's like the whole back pew and that's it. <laughs> raise your hand if you think power is not good. Okay, I see we have a bunch of abstainers. What's with this? Power used correctly, she says in the back. Yes, but that's not my question. You're not supposed to get that it's a trick question. <laughs> power can be very good. But power also corrupts quickly when it is left unchecked. We easily forget that only Lucifer sought power. Lucifer would take, possess, control, and use every trick in the book. Manipulation, deceit, falsehood, lies, intimidation, enticement, bribery. It's all there. Every single one is on the table and fair game. Christ seeks to give. That's it. Jesus and the Father are one in their identity of love. God will win us to his heart with love or not at all. He has one tool, actually two, love and the truth. That's it. All the other tools in that manipulation toolbox belong to Lucifer alone. And if our parenting or discipline or church board meetings or evangelism looks like manipulation and intimidation and deception and twisting and warping and bribery and enticement and deceit and bait and switch and all of that stuff. It's not from Jesus. That's a side soapbox. When church people, members or leaders, focus on power instead of servanthood, whether it's in our marriages or in our classes or in our small groups or in our congregation or in our community at large, we perpetuate an atmosphere that allows abuse to thrive. And it is the opposite of the character of God. Men were not created to be sexual predators or to use their power to deceive or to exploit or to control or dominate other men or women or children. Women were not created to be controlled or used or abused. Each of us has power. A newborn has power. Do you know what power a newborn has? A newborn has tremendous power because a newborn's cry will get exhausted grown-ups out of bed 15 times a night. Newborns have power. Parents have power. Men have power, women have power, children have power. It is all in how we use the power and influence that we are given. Are we using it to bless? Are we using it to lighten the load of those around us? Are we using it to exploit? Are we using it to perpetrate? Or are we using it to protect, using it to provide, using it to be wise and healing in our influence? Power is not the bad thing. The exploitation of power is what does not come from God. In my house, we have some little science nerds. And I find little containers of goopy slime. <sighs> and I find rocks, and I find leaves, and I find things pressed into books, and I find geode crystal experiments on the fireplace, and I find all kinds of stuff. They like things like petri dishes. 
You see, I was an English major. This was not my jam. Still isn't, but I let them run wild with it. When we have a Petri dish, where do you put it if you want it to grow nasty stuff? You want it warm, you want it damp, and you want it in the dark. So, if we have darkness surrounding sin, surrounding these pockets of abused power, it's like a Petri dish. And as long as we keep it in the dark, what's going to happen? It's going to grow. Those little spores will multiply and spread. And if you want to kill it, what are you going to do? Take it out, put it on a cold windowsill in straight sunlight, and that stuff is going to dry right up. But as long as you leave it warm and damp in the dark, it's going to spread. It's going to take everything over. So the question is, how do we sterilize and expose the darkness of sin in the church? I hear a lot of people say things like, do not air the dirty laundry. Ever heard that? Don't talk about these things. We don't want the news to get a hold of it. We don't want anyone else to think badly of the church. Don't hurt the church's reputation. Or, we can take it a little closer to home, don't hurt our family's reputation. Don't say anything that would make us look less than perfect to the outside public. So let me turn that question around. What looks worse to the world when we're talking about the church? Hearing that some sinful humans did some sinful things inside a church filled with sinful humans, and the church promptly addressed it and dealt with it in a way that protected those who were vulnerable and unsafe, or hearing that some sinful humans did some really sinful things in a church filled with sinful humans, and the church turned a blind eye, enabled the abusers, silenced the victims, and let those other new victims just keep on piling up. Which one makes us look awful and unappealing to the outside world? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58, and then keep your Bibles open, because we're going to go on a marathon. Isaiah chapter 58, we're going to start at the very beginning. Say amen when you get there. And then just keep your Bible open here. We're going to keep coming back to Isaiah 58 even while we flip around. So, anybody there? Amen. All right. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed, God? We've been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. They're really hurt over this. I will tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing others. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This, find, this kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds, bending in the wind, nodding and smiling. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? I don't know if there's much better description of fake repentance and crocodile tears than this right here. This premise isn't really so different than what Jesus said in Matthew 18. Turn over with me to Matthew 18. Many of you have heard of the classic conflict resolution passage. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. This is the formula that Jesus Christ gives, but it's actually, we call it conflict resolution. I'm not convinced that that's what Christ was talking about. Let me explain why. If another believer sins, some versions include the words against you, but not all. If another
one other believer sins, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. In other words, an, a person without salvation, an outsider, someone who does not hold standing in the church congregation. Now, let's break this down just a little bit because I have heard of multiple situations where someone had been abused and um, they were told, well, have you followed Matthew 18? Have you gone to the person that you're saying raped you and asked them, confronted them alone, quietly? Have you done that yet? We can't help you until you do that. Oh, I've heard it many times. Sometimes even with minors, when the perpetrator was not a minor and we were talking criminal felonies. I've heard that. So let's just imagine that it was not at all a sexual situation. Let's say you came out of work or you'd been to the mall or it was late at night and you'd stopped by Walmart to grab some fruit for the morning, and as you go get in your car, someone slams you on the back of the head with a crowbar and carjacks you. And when you went to tell your church family about it, or the police, they said, well, you know, have you followed Matthew 18? Have you, have you gone and talked to the guy who hit you over a head with a crowbar and, and asked him if you really meant to do that. Maybe, maybe you had a misunderstanding. You know, maybe, maybe your head just got in the way and they were like playing batting practice near your car, you know. I mean, why, why didn't you just give him the keys to your car? Then you wouldn't have gotten hit on the head. But really, we can't help you. You can't file a police report until you've gone alone to the person who put you in the ER and split your head open and caused you 14 stitches and you've just, you know, discussed it quietly alone, personally. If someone told you that, what would your reaction be? Forget it. <laughs> Forget it? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Where is the justice in this situation? Okay, but we do this to those who have been on the receiving end of abuse all the time. This is not what Christ was talking about in this passage. In this passage, just to kind of wrap that up, he was, he was talking about, he says, if a brother, a brother is a peer, you're equal. There's no power differential. They're not in charge over you. There's not a huge age gap. There's not a massive influential differential. Influential differential, I like that. Um, you're in, in, in the passage of Matthew 18, 15 to 17, it isn't even required to be a direct sin against you, necessarily. If you see your brother sinning, now I'm going to pick on Crystal because she's the only female face I know here. If I see you doing something that I know is a sin, and as your sister in Christ, I go to you and I say, I see this happening in your life, and it's going to cause you harm. I really am concerned about this. That's what this passage is talking about. Yeah. Holding those around us, our peers, our equals, accountable to the knowledge that we have for reflecting Jesus Christ. So instead of going and saying to the church, hey, you know what? Guess what Crystal's doing in her free time? No. I go to Crystal and I say, hey, sis, what's, what's going on? How can I help support you with this thing I see taking over your life? I want to be there for you. And if she's like, I don't want help right now, or, yeah, I see that, but I'm really struggling with it, I can come back to it and bring another girlfriend along. And they're like, hey, we're here together to help you with this because this is going to destroy your life and we don't want your life destroyed because we love you, we care about you, we want you to be healthy and strong and safe and to be okay. So we're here to help you with this thing that's in your life. And at that point, if she was to say, you know what, get lost. 
I like this thing in my life better than I want to do any of that stuff you're talking about. That's when step three is involved and we take it to the church and we say, this person is choosing not to live according to Christ-like principles. They need to not be a member of the church with the same level, that doesn't mean they can't fellowship, but with the same level of power and influence and title and leadership, perhaps. Thanks for letting me pick on you. What this is not saying is conflict resolution in an abusive situation. But Jesus didn't leave that unaddressed. He did address it. In fact, he addressed it in this same passage. Just a few verses earlier, he got to that. He took care of that part first before he got to the personal peer accountability topic. In my Bible, I have to flip the page back. But Matthew 18, verses 5 and 6. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and drown in the depths of the sea. Why? Because by the time you are capable of causing that level of harm to someone vulnerable, your conscience is dead already. That is not an entry level. Jesus is not talking about entry level sins. He's not talking about the beginning of harm. He's talking about someone who has a hardened conscience. And at that point, he says it's better millstones, meat necks, go swimming. It's an entirely different recommendation than when you have a peer who is struggling with something and you're eager to help them improve their life. Not to be conflated. Turn with me to John chapter 3. John 3, 20 and 21. Now let's go back to those Petri dishes that we talk about. Keeping things in the dark. John 3, chapter 20. Actually, I'm going to read the second half of verse 19. People loved the darkness more than the light for... Why? Their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it. Why? For fear that their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. If someone wants to keep sin in the dark, especially the type of sin that is patterned, repeated, habitual behaviors that cause egregious harm to others, the vulnerable of God's children, they are not of God. Take that one step forward, still in the writings of John, but 1 John chapter 4. Flip all the way over there with me. 1 John chapter 4. Again, verses 20 and 21. John liked to stick really good stuff in verses 20 and 21 in his chapters, right? I know, they didn't have verses back then. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer. Now, this is not just, I dislike you. Acting with hatred to someone, well, abuse would fall under that category, right? Exploiting someone is not acting in love. Damaging and harming and taking advantage of someone is not acting in love. If someone hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. But then that begs the question, love for whom? And how do we love well? Often in church, we focus heavily on showing what we believe to be love to the more powerful and persuasive perpetrators of abuse, while we easily dismiss the irritating and messy brokenness of the survivor. However, showing true, genuine love means not enabling, not warm fuzzies, not just lots of hugs and warm welcomes and handshakes. I mean, it's COVID, so we don't do handshakes, but you know what I mean. That 
that's not what God is talking about when he says to love well. Showing true, genuine, Christ-like love means doing what is most likely to keep both safe and to bring both victim and perpetrator to the point of salvation and freedom in Christ. Sin, like love, is relational. It is the violation of the relational law of God's character. Amen? Amen? Sin's primary destruction impacts our relationships first with God and then with others. And when abuse is perpetrated, the abuser is violating relationship both with God and with the other person. Consequently, when churches urge victims to forgive and forget, to embrace that instantaneous reconciliation without extended significant time allotted for the abuser to show lasting, transformative heart change, we are, as church leaders, simultaneously telling the abuser that very first lie from Genesis 3, your sin does not cause death. We are siding with the serpent in the tree. In real life, silence regarding abuse, assault, domestic violence, abusive systems, silence sentences the victims to a lifetime of being beaten and torn down and assaulted by fists or words or both. That's not allowing God to transform an, a rebellious and abusive heart. It's standing as a buffer between the abuser and their consequences. It's not encouraging gospel transformation. It's preventing the abuser, the perpetrator's ultimate dependence on God. That's not living in wholeness in the gospel. It's modeling an apathetic acceptance of dysfunction and conditioning the next generation to accept abuse as their norm. When we tell victims to keep on suffering abuse in order to win your abuser to Jesus, we are preaching a forgiveness-based, fraudulent savior complex. This approach manipulates the victim's conscience and silences them by using their desire to do right in an exploitative way. It effectively places the victims of abuse in the role of Christ on the cross sacrificing themselves for the protection of the abuser and shouldering the fallout of all the harmful behaviors perpetrated against them by preventing the person perpetrating the abuse from experiencing the full weight of their justly earned consequences. I know y'all may never invite me back. But it's okay. I can live with that. God does not forget Forgive and remember. Forgive and forget is rubbish advice. Forgive and forget means you didn't learn a lesson. It means nothing changed. It means you didn't see the pattern. But isn't the church supposed to be a welcoming place for sinners? So how do we balance these things? There is a big difference between sheltering broken, sinful, repentant sheep and letting wolves in sheep's clothing come feed inside the sheepfold with our eyes blinded. Someone just said, trust but verify. Trust but verify. I would agree. Anything resembling force, even forced forgiveness, forced love, or forced repentance is contrary to the nature of Christ and cannot be emulated. Victims cannot be forced to forgive, and abusers cannot be forced to repent. To do either is to violate God's law of love and liberty. Free will means forgiveness occurs purposefully and voluntarily, and simultaneously God's commitment to free will also means respecting the choice of an unrepentant abuser not to change, not to submit to accountability, and not to embrace lasting humility. Abuse and misconduct in the church is no myth. 
Some people would like to think it is, but there are documented scandals, cover-ups, and cases of abuse in the Baptist Church, in the Catholic Church, in the Presbyterian Church, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the, the Amish community, in the Mennonite community, and I work with advocates and warriors who stand beside those who are experiencing and healing from these things in a number of denominations every day. Sadly, the most common scenario across denominations features those in power bungling the fallout, underreporting criminal behavior, blaming the victims, and ultimately enabling the abuser's freedom to continue harming either the original victim or a pile of new ones. When one party acts abusively, the victim is often made to feel that it is somehow their responsibility, their conscientious obligation to save and protect the perpetrator. But victims cannot rescue abusers, not through prayer, not through submission, not even by reducing themselves to the point of erasing their God-given identity. There is no rescue until an abusive person is ready and willing to take drastic steps toward repentant change. And the data says that's fewer than 1 in 10. Saying sorry does not equal repentance. Keeping silence does not equal repentance. Repentance is evidenced only through turning away from toxic behaviors. Silence is not how God defines loving others well. Silence is not the scriptural formula for inspiring abusers to embrace humble change. Silence is not part of the biblical process of forgiveness. Silence does not bring transformation. Silence does not facilitate healing. Silence does not save the lambs. Rather, Scripture calls us to show love by speaking the truth about sin. Isaiah 5.20, what sorrow for those who say evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Minimizing the sin, making it appear to be less dangerous than it is in God's eyes, is the opposite of God's way of handling those who reject his law of love. Remember in our video, statistics tell us that the average sexual predator has 50 to 150 victims before their first arrest. But did you catch the second part of that statistic? And many more after. Why? That's because the first arrest very rarely comes with enough evidence in our criminal justice system to meet the evidentiary standard of guilty beyond reasonable doubt. That's like an 85 to 95% proof that this person did it. That's, that's a standard that they have to meet. That doesn't mean they're not guilty, it just means there wasn't enough proof. That's because those who are capable of harming the vulnerable in that kind of way have also cultivated a terrific ability to groom and charm not only their victims, but also everyone in the community around them. This makes it extremely dangerous to allow known offenders to mingle with families and children in any church environment. Now, sometimes we say, well, what if they have a chaperone? What if they, what if they sign an understanding? What if, what if we watch them very closely? But presence in the church congregation is by nature an endorsement of safety. What if you have someone who has that history, and yes, they are watched very carefully, and they never do a thing in the church, on the church grounds, but they're always around watched very closely. What happens when they show up at the local community volleyball game or the little league game and someone's child says, oh, I know them from church. Presence is endorsement of safety. Now that sounds harsh to many, but one of my favorite 19th century authors who happens to be a woman who was one of the most prolific authors of her century. She wrote pointed, unflinching advice regarding how to handle 
in the church community those who had harmed children. And I'm going to give you two quotes that were specifically related as far as the historians know to situations of child molestation and incest. This one is from a book called First Testimonies and is found on page 215. For those who would like to be Bereans, go home, fact check me and make sure I'm not making this up. It says, it is impossible for E to be fellowshipped by the church of God. He has placed himself where he cannot be helped by the church, where he can have no communion with nor voice in the church. He has placed himself there in the face of light and truth. He has stubbornly chosen his own course and refused to listen to reproof. He has followed the inclinations of his corrupt heart, has violated the holy law of God, and has disgraced the cause of present truth. If he repents ever so heartily, the church must let his case alone. If he goes to heaven, it must be alone without the fellowship of the church. A standing rebuke from God in the church must ever rest upon him that the standard of morality be not lowered to the very dust. Here's another one. In the same series of books, on page 10 of the book called Six Testimonies, or Testimonies, Volume 6. I was shown that you had been wrong in sympathizing with H.C., and the course you have taken in regard to him has injured your influence and greatly injured the cause of God. It is impossible for H.C. to be fellowshipped by the Church of God. Same phrasing, different case. He has placed himself where he cannot be helped by the church. He can have no communion with nor voice in the church. He has placed himself there in the face of light and truth. The same thing. If he goes to heaven, it must be alone without the fellowship of the church. A standing rebuke from God in the church must ever rest upon him that the standard of morality be not lowered to the very dust. The Lord is displeased with your course in these things. In our modern culture, that does not sound like a lot of loving well, or a lot of love, but it is loving well. Because our goal, our purpose, in how we conduct delicate situations in the church is to always be looking for safety for the lambs. This does not mean that someone cannot be forgiven and cannot find salvation after harming innocent people. It does mean that they cannot be trusted to safely interact with potential victims again. It doesn't mean that they are guaranteed to be shut out of heaven or that God is not capable of gospel transformation in a once hardened heart. It just means you can never know if you are being manipulated and deceived once that has happened. Jesus isn't interested in what makes our community have some glossy public image. He takes no joy in his children looking great on the outside for our own sake. Serving and discipleship are not means to the end of self-aggrandizement about inverted pride of how humble we are and how great everything is here. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 58. You know, they didn't give me a time limit. And I haven't been watching the clock. Oh, there's a clock right in front of me. Shocking. What time do you usually get out? Never? Never? <laughs> Ever. <laughs> no, seriously, what time do you usually get out? About 1230? Will that work? That's only eight minutes. That's seven minutes. Sometimes one o'clock. Sometimes one o'clock. Oh, good. Does anybody else concur with him, or is he standing alone in this? <laughs> Hey, I want to be respectful of your time and your tummies and your lunch. So, you know, just got to check here. But, but literally, you can blame Pastor Paul. He did not give me any time length consideration at all. So back to Isaiah 58. Let's go look at verses 6 through 9. This continues our passage. He says, no, this is the kind of fasting I want, not the kind that makes you look really good on the outside. Not the kind that makes you look holy to the public. 
Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. That includes emotional bondage, right? Not just physical slaves and physical shackles. That includes those who are living in bondage today. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, socially that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. How many times have abuse victims come to me and said, my family won't hear of it? I am not allowed to speak about what I endured with my family because they don't want to deal with it. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. Verse 8, then, this is one of those conditional things. God does this often. These are the criteria, then I will do this. That kind of language implies that if we are not doing the first part, he cannot do the second part, right? Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Then your godliness will lead you forward. What is your godliness? Your reflection of the character of Christ. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. What is his glory? His glory is his character. His glory is his identity. His glory is the essence of who he is, which is his character. God's character will protect you from behind. Where is a warrior most vulnerable? From behind, at your back. That means, this is, this is Isaiah's very antiquated way of saying, God's got your back. God's character will have your back. You cannot be pierced by the arrows of the enemy because God's character will protect you from behind when, and only when, you are doing these things. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply, remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry, verse 10, and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. No more Petri dishes growing in the dark. Then the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. So we are to shout out the sins being hidden, free the prisoners, uh, uh, release the oppressed, remove the chains that bind. And you know what? Once we have experienced trauma and abuse, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in your childhood home, whether it's in the church and the faith community or some other toxic, damaging relationship, we each get the option to decide how we respond to the trauma. We can either stay in the wilderness and stagnate and get bitter and grow hard and brittle and apply the results of what happened to us to everyone equally. Or we can decide to make a choice to journey out of the wilderness, to transform, let God transform those limps and those scars into talking points for his healing and what he has done in your life. That's why what we do is called wilderness to wild. Out of the wilderness, into the wild. I've worked with thousands of women who have experienced some of the most horrific traumas you can imagine. 90 plus percent of them experienced those traumas inside what some would call the protective walls of the faith community. I've seen women wither and wilt and fade away, and I've seen women turn angry and hateful and filled with poison that spews out on everyone around them, and I've seen women blossom into the most beautiful and confident creatures all after experiencing almost the same things. It's all in how we choose to respond to it and whether we choose to allow healing to take place. So what is the church's role in all of these painful topics? Go with me to verse 11 in Isaiah 58. The Lord will guide you continually. 
Because when you have done this and your salvation comes and your wounds quickly heal and your godliness leads you forward and you are protected from behind and you call knowing that Jesus will answer because you know him. Then the Lord will guide you continually. The light that shines from him, that is derivative light, it doesn't come from us, shines out and exposes the darkness. He will give you water when you are dry. He will restore your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Light brings healing. Sunlight brings fresh growth. When sin is exposed and confessed and no longer covered, then and only then can we have revival and healing in the church. Until that point, as long as we are refusing to talk about these hard subjects and to deal with them appropriately, until that point, we are just like Israel when Achan had buried his, his loot under his tent in the camp. The entire body suffers. The buried and hidden sin, you can go read that story this afternoon in Joshua 7 through 9 if you'd like. The buried and hidden sin will wreak havoc on the safety, stability, and strength of the vulnerable in the community and even those who are strong. God cannot bless the extended community where sin lies covered in secret or enabled by silence. If we stay in God's light, Our lives are increasingly sterilized, protected against the spiritual contagion. We become more radically committed to seeking and speaking the truth, regardless of the fallout. That's why I'm like, hey, you know what? You guys don't want to ever, ever talk about this again? You don't want to have anybody come back and discuss this? That's okay. Now, I hope that's not the truth. Because I think you have a friend of mine scheduled to come and do some trainings. (laughs) But it's okay when you are committed to seeking the truth and speaking the truth. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13 tells us, do not participate in darkness. Expose the deeds of darkness. Use the light to make things visible and expose sin in the light. Go back to Isaiah 58, 12. Some of you, When we do this, we'll rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls, the walls that protect, and a restorer of homes. When we address abuse without cowering in fear of scandal, when we have the institutional fortitude to hold abusers accountable inside the church, when we look with open eyes at the patterns of belief that perpetuate abusive behaviors in our own systems, we are not airing the dirty laundry. We are showing the world that in this place we do the laundry. You don't hang dirty clothes out on the line. Now, some of you guys here are too young to even know what it means to wash clothes and hang them out on the line. But I'm not. I grew up doing that. We didn't have a dryer in my house when I was a little kid. And it was my job to go hang that stuff out on the line. I can't remember my mother ever once telling me to go hang the dirty laundry on the line. It was only after it had been cleaned, bleached, scrubbed, spotless, that's when it went out on the line. If you don't ever do the laundry, you may not notice it, but other people will, because you're going to start to stink. When we do the laundry... We are addressing the issues that stink in our midst. The calling of Isaiah 58 is to live out the gospel in a healing way every day. At home, at school, at work, at church, but absolutely refusing to leave oppression unaddressed.